Now, if you think about it, it doesn't make any sense. If you take a monopoly game and you create more monopoly money and pass it out, everybody knows it has no value. But we've literally endorsed the concept that if we just print money and pass it out, everybody's going to be wealthy. And because it's government, and because it was related to a gold standard, and because foreigners will take money, this system continues to work because there's still trust in the money. But eventually, this trust will be lost. There's, the wealth cannot be created by creating new money. Yes, if the Federal Reserve prints more money today and hands it to me, I can go spend it and I can feel wealthier. But in the grand scheme of things, you don't create wealth that way. And that's also the reason why productivity growth is down. We do not create it. We have to have incentives. We have to encourage work and effort. That's the only place you can get wealth. So our taxes are too high, the regulations are too high, we borrow too much money, interest rates are too high, and we discourage savings, all because of this monetary system. So eventually, we are going to be required to do something about that, to restore trust in the money, so we do save money, so we work harder. But we have to lower taxes, we have to get rid of regulations, we have to get rid of taxes on capital gains, and get rid of taxes on, on savings and interest, and get rid of taxes on inheritance. Then people would have more of an incentive to work rather than just to borrow. So the illusion of wealth today is that which comes from uh, a fiat or paper uh, monetary uh, system. We need today a very serious debate on what the monetary system ought to be all about. It cannot be a debate which is isolated from the role of government. If we have a role of government which is to run the welfare state, to give anything to anybody who needs something or wants something or claims it's an entitlement or claims it's a right. If that is a system of government that we want to perpetuate, it's going to be very, very difficult to have any reform. If we continue to believe that this country is the policeman of the world, that we must police the world and build bases overseas at the same time, we neglect our own uh, national defense, our own borders, our own bases here at home, but we continue to spend money in places like Bosnia and, and Africa and play for the defense of Japan and Europe, uh, as long as we accept those ideas, there is no way we can restore any sanity to our budget. So I'm suggesting to my colleagues here in the Congress that what we must do is address the subject of what the role of government ought to be. There should be a precise role for government. That's what the whole idea and issue was of the Constitutional Convention as well as our revolution. We didn't like the role of government that the uh, English and the British had given us, and we uh, here in the United States decided that the role of government ought to be there for the preservation of liberty. It shouldn't be, the role of government ought not to be to redistribute wealth. It ought not to be the counterfeiter of the world to create money out of thin air. It's illegal for you or I to uh, counterfeit money. And why, why do we allow the government to counterfeit the money and make it worthless and, and make it worth less all the time? And as long as we accept that, uh, we're going to have big problems. But there will be a time coming, and I suggest to all my colleagues that uh, we be ready for it because it's so serious. Not only is it a serious threat to our physical and economic well-being, the greater threat is the threat to our individual liberty because as conditions worsen and if we have to face up to our problems so often the response is, all we need is another government program. And that is, st that is still an attitude that I see all the time around here that, you know, if we just have a little more tax money, already in this very early Congress, we have had tax increases in spite of the rhetoric against taxes. We've been raising taxes. We've increased the amount of regulations. We have done nothing to really address the subject. But it's usually, uh, that, that comes from the fact that we never really ask the right questions. What, what, is the, what should the role of government be? And uh, the founders, as they uh, uh, concluded after the revolution, as they wrote the Constitution, it very clearly was stated that the role of government, especially at the federal level, level, ought to be there to protect the individual liberties of all individuals, no matter what. But today, we have lost that as a goal and as a target. We concentrate, whether it's our businessman or the person that's receiving welfare benefits, the concentration is on the material benefits that usually come from a free society in a voluntary way. But today, if anybody wants something or they need something or think they have a right to it, what do they do? They order a political action committee and come to Washington. 
I was gone for a few years. I was here in the Congress first in 76, and after returning, there's one dramatic difference. There are more lobbyists than ever, more demands, more people coming in, more people wanting things. And I have more demands from the business community than I do from those who receive from the poor end of the spectrum. There is a vicious maldistribution of wealth in a, in a society that destroys its money. Inevitably, if a country destroys its money, it destroys its middle class. This is what's happening in this country already. The poor middle class individual who is still proud enough not to go on the dole and not to take welfare, that's the individual who suffers the very most. And he's the one that's the most threatened by the loss of job in the next downturn. Currently, right now, Wall Street, are they suffering from this financial bubble that I see? No, if you're in the stock market or the bond market or borrowing overseas, they're doing quite well. People say you worry too much. There is no inflation, no matter what you say about the money supply and all these things you talk about. There is no inflation. Don't worry about it. Inflation deals with money, not prices. So if the, as I said earlier, I believe prices are going up much faster than the government will admit. But at the same time, uh, the, uh, the supply of uh, money and credit uh, continues uh, to expand. So we will, we will have to eventually address these, the, these problems. And I think it will be uh, up to us as members of Congress to at least make some plans. Because uh, if we do not, if we do not make the plans, I see this as a serious, serious threat to our personal, our personal liberties. It will not be a simple reform that we need. We have to do something more than that. We have to start thinking about what do we need to do to really change the course. Is there anything wrong with addressing the subject of individual liberty? Is there anything wrong with talking about the value and the importance of sound money? I claim there is nothing wrong with that, but there's very little debate. There's very little debate among our committee members and in our committees to, to address this. It's usually how do we tide ourselves over? How do we modify this to a slight degree? But the time will come, the time will come because we will go bankrupt because no country has ever done this before. No country can live beyond its means endlessly. No country can spend and inflate and destroy its money. There will be this transfer of wealth. It happened in, in many, many countries in this century. Of course, one example of the 20th century was the German inflation, and then there has to always be a scapegoat. The middle class suffers the most. Somebody has to be blamed. Currently today, I see a trend toward those of us who advocate limited government, those who detest big government as becoming the scapegoat, saying, oh, you individuals who are against big government, you're the people who cause trouble and you cause ferment and unhappiness. That is not the case. People are unhappy. And I meet them all the time because they're having a different call time making it in this, uh, in this day and age. Who knows who the next scapegoat will be, but there will be one. But the middle class in America will have to eventually join in the reforms that we need. The reforms can be all positive. There's nothing wrong with advocating limited government. There's nothing wrong in the American spirit to advocate the Constitution. There's nothing wrong with the American tradition that says work is good. And there is something wrong that, uh, that uh, with a system that endorses and encourages and pushes the idea that we have the right to somebody else's life and somebody else's earnings. I don't believe that is the case. I think that's morally wrong. I don't believe it's been uh, permitted under the Constitution. And it also leads to trouble. If it led to prosperity, it would be a harder argument for me. But if it leads to trouble and if it leads to people being undermined uh, in their financial security and their economic security, then we have to do something else. I would like to invite those who uh, express deep concern about the poor, and those who advocate more, uh, more programs, more welfare programs, I'd like to suggest they need to look at monetary policy, they need to look at deficits, and they need to realize that wealth has to be created. And if we truly do care about the poor people in this country, and if we do care about the people trying to build homes, that public housing obviously hasn't worked. We've been doing public houses now and spent nearly $600 billion, and there is no sign that we have done much for the people that we have given public housing to. We have spent $5 trillion on welfare. They're more homeless than ever. The educational system is worse than ever. And yet we don't really say, well, what should we do differently? 
And sometimes we'll say, well, let's take the management and change the management. Let's take the bureaucrats from Washington and put them in the state. Let's do block grants. Let's make a, my, a few minor adjustments and everything is going to be okay. And it won't be. We won't make it okay until we address the subject of what kind of a, society, a society that we want to live in. I want to live in a free society. Fortunately for me, as a member of Congress, and as one that has sworn to uphold the Constitution, this is, to, this is an easy argument. It should be an easy argument for all my colleagues who would say, yes, I've sworn to uphold the Constitution. I believe in America. I believe in hard work. But why do you vote for all these other programs? Why do you vote for all the deficits? Why are we getting ready to vote for more taxes soon? Why are we voting a supplemental appropriation? Why are we doing these things if we really are serious? I have not yet seen any serious attempt to cut back on spending and cut back on taxes. Someday we'll have to do it. The sooner the better. If we do it in a graceful manner, there is no pain in suffering. The American people will not suffer if you cut their taxes. The American people won't suffer if you lower the amount of regulations. The American people won't suffer if you get out of their lives and not give them 100,000 regulations to follow day in and day out. The American people won't suffer if the federal government gets out of the management of education and medicine. That's the day I'm waiting for and the day I'm working for. And hopefully, I will get other members of Congress here to join me in this effort to support the concepts and the principles of individual freedom. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the following members be permitted to extend their remarks and to include extraneous materials in that section of the record entitled Extension of Remarks. Mr. Greenwood, Ehrlich, Thomas, Stokes, Coyne, Frank of Massachusetts, Clements on two occasions, Etheridge, and Mr. Ford. That objection is so ordered. I move the House now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to.